So thanks very much uh, for joining us today, Oz, and please take it away. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you very much for the invitation, first of all. And as Sarah mentioned, please shoot the questions. And if something is not clear, it's my accent or the figures are not clear, please jump in. And also this is somewhat with the omics, I jump into different topics. I feel new in everything I will be talking. So please excuse, uh, actually, please jump in and give your opinion. I would love to have that. So my lab is working on the, in the uh, intermediate of the neurodegeneration and aging. And first of all, I wanted to thank the people who did the work. Uh, Peter Kat Peter is the postdoc who did this uh, spatial transcript, Thomas, Catherine, amazing PhD student, Tuberg, done the nature neuroscience study with Laura, Simon uh, graduated, my first PhD student, and we kind of, uh, two of us build up the most of the thing, and the rest of the team how, and others I need to thank. And nearly all of the study is done in a close partnership who le uh, kind of stayed in Munich. Uh, Mika Simons, uh, Shima, Ludo, uh, Ludo, and Nicola, we work really closely. And Martina Schaefer, who is the electron microscopy uh, head in Munich, has been very uh, effective collaboration. We done the uh, spatial transcriptomic electron microscopy together. Of course, we wouldn't do that without the money, thanks to funders. So when I started my group and I was, actually I worked all my career uh, on the basal ganglia circuit. And some, when I started, it was a aging and dementia, stroke and dementia institute. And I need to change the topic, but also I kind of wanted. Uh, looking to the, resources, I find something very interesting to focus on. So this is a, um, a diagram of the incidence rate of the different diseases and your life quality, health span. And all of these diseases, chronic disorders, as we age, their risk is linearly increasing. Except something interesting happening on dementia. If you look to the dementia, it starts with a slow slope, and then there's an infliction point around 65. And then it's not actually more than if you look to the cardiovascular disease or other disease cancer, but it catches up with other disorders. And if you think about it, it's really weird why we have this infliction point. And to be honest, I just didn't know so much. And then looking to the studies, what we found is one uh, key aging parameter is the white matter, loss of the white matter. And when we look to the loss of the white matter, uh, that's actually here in the dark. Most of our brain is white matter tracks and they are decreasing just after the 65 significant. And you can see it much dramatically on the enlargement of the ventricular volume. So what uh, my group uh, with Simone and me focused on, we did micro dissection of a very small white matter tracts in mice. Mice white matter is much less than the human. And we dissociated and learned how to isolate and use the smart sec for that. And later on, uh, 10X. And these are actually, we have a protocol for that. And with this, when we look to the aged white matter, versus the young uh, age gray matter, what we saw is there is a microglia response specific to the white matter tracks. As you can see here, we call it, what well, like we called it because see, we find it in the white matter, we called it white matter associated microglia. And looking to the, this <clears throat> response, it remains quite uh, damp, but it's actually quite milder than them. So what you see here is all the phagocytotic genes and antigen presentation. And uh, then we see the, a lot of neurodegenerative disease related genes upregulated and loss of the homeostatic genes. If you compare to that, to the dam, actually this induction is quite moderate. 
when we look to this uh, cells in plus, these are actually not single cells in a way. Here you see four or five of them combines together and they are filled with myelin, digesting myelin in the white matter. And here you see in the ventricular zone, there are a lot of them. And in the electron microscope as well, we see the uh, this microglia uh, walls, uh, microglia nodules. To understand a little bit mechanistically, we decide to look are these we decide to look to tram2 knockout because tram2 is as you know well is a one of the top uh, alzheimer disease risks but actually if you uh, look to the people that lost both of the tram2 ILs, no fun uh, loss of function mutations have they develop nasocola disease which is marked by the loss of the white matter and from this we aged the uh, TRAM2 knockout mice again to two years and looked to this uh, 18 months and then looked to this mouse uh, white matter tracks. And as you see in the uh, gray matter, we don't see any uh, activated microglia, but in the white matter, what we see is again a WAM, white matter activated microglia in the wild type, and that was totally lost in the uh, TRAM2 knockout. So, this is quite resembling the uh, dam knockout, dam uh, disease associated microglia, that uh, uh, white matter associated microglia was TRAM2 dependent. We also looked to the APOE dependency because dam is APOE dependent as well. TRAM2 did not show the APOE dependency. So we see um, uh, dam TRAM2 induced dam uh, disease associated a program, a long program, and VAM is somewhat in the initial phase of that. And looking to this mice, TRAM2 mice, or H mice more closely, what we saw is this myelin walls. These are, in the H mice, you see this beautiful axons, everything is okay, you see happy mitochondria, and TRAM2 knockout doesn't look so happy. And you see this uh, bunch of myelin walls, and this is significant that 18 months starts difference. Before 18 months, there is no significant difference. And we actually inspired from that, and a Turkish artist made this picture, and we got the neurons cover inspired for that, uh, myelin walls. And it's actually quite well received study. Uh, what it placed the uh, uh, link to the uh, homeostatic and the uh, physiological microglial responses during development, adulthood, and when the myelin damage is occurring, we have white matter associated microglia program, which we believe is uh, initial stemming for all other diseases. Um, uh, that the microglia uses this program in different alternations uh, to cause them, MG and BD, you can name a lot of them, but it is TRAM2 dependent disease associated microglia program. And we show that this is specifically suitable in the non-disease animals to maintain the white matter. So, that was the quest, but if you remember, our first question was not the, how we can, how the microglia extend that, what is the insult that induced white matter loss? And what we found is there's a microglia that actually preserves the microglia state, white matter associated microglia state, that preserves the integrity of the white matter tracks. But what is the hitting there? What's the punch? So to address that, again with Mika, Tuberk and Laura and Nico from Mika's lab, uh, we team up together. This time we deplete the uh, uh, microglia. When you deplete the microglia, you get most oligodendrocytes. And looking to the oligodendrocytes, we saw this, again, white matter specific species a really significant age-related serpent 2 and dependent uh, look positive uh, oligodendrocyte, which we called RO, age-related oligos, and this 3% interferon-response oligodendrocytes. 
I must say I was pretty was looking forward to focus on the arrows and dismiss the arrows. And just Laura uh, me make this experiment. We thought it could be like a supplementary and just to show there are no CD8 T cells inducing that eros. And she actually came back and uh, there are always T cells. And we were like, what? We don't like the, is the staining true? Because we brain immune privilege, little, uh, as I said, I'm uh, immunologist in training. And we were really surprised there are T cells in the uh, brain inducing that effect. And we done a careful characterization of the T cells. What we saw is at three months, we were right. There were no T cells and maybe noise staining. And, but the 24 months, we saw a massive increase of the uh, T cells in the white matter tracks, not in the gray matter. And not all the white matter tracks, actually. This was specific to the ventricular regions. And there's nearly 90% of these T cells were CD8. It's we see an increase of the CD8 ventric, uh, ventricular white matter tracts. Uh, and this is includes neurogenic niche as well. And there are many studies also show similar results from Anne Burnett and others. So that kind of made sense. But, but we wanted to know, are they the really we think them near is the reason that we have more interferon response oligos. We take advantage of the um, uh, we take advantage of the uh, uh, cancer drugs uh, checkpoint inhibitors, and we treated both checkpoints PD one and CTL four for six weeks, and we saw tenfold increase of this interferon response population. And to show on the opposite side, we took out of the uh, immune system by getting RAC1 knockout. RAC1 is the uh, recombinase that makes this TCR, BCR recombination and required for functional B and T cells. And we age this mice two years. Yeah, again, okay, two years. Uh, and we looked, we did the single cell transcriptomics. And what we saw is interferon response oligodendrocytes were disappeared in this uh age mice and uh, so we have very little or none interferon response uh, on the uh on the ragnarok mice but what does it mean we are talking about three percent of a white matter track oligos does it really make a importance to understand to ask this question we look to the rock one knockout and uh, versus the wild type 24 month old mice oligodendrocytes here cc1 is labels the oligos and you can see and uh, this counting of the oligos in the gray matter we don't see any change on the gray matter during aging or the ragnacot let's say but during uh in the white matter we see a age dependent loss of uh, oligodendrocyte density and that was rescued that was really cool because actually it was scary cool because that's what we set to start and vascular. There were a lot of hypotheses as we have why the white matter is shrinking and Raghwan Nakat rescued it. So kind of we were skeptical. Reviewer was also skeptical. So they asked us to look to the CD8 knockout. So we H the CD8 knockouts that only lacks the functional CD8 T cells, again, two years, uh, and look to the interferon response oligos, and they were very significant loss. Then we'll look to the density of the oligodendrocyte, total density, this 3%, does it make a big difference uh, on the overall oligodendrocyte survival? And we see actually Again, same type of a protection we saw in the interferon response oligodendrocytes. And, and this is actually really a uh, few months later, uh, Adrian Liston from UK come up with uh, another paper. Instead of he depleting this uh, T cells, he introduced T-Rex into the nervous uh, aging brain 
and show almost similar phenotype. And we were like, whew, we are, that's, and like, and these studies, I think both of them should be recognized in parallel because uh, aging studies takes forever. Uh, and that was really convincing seeing multiple groups showing this effect. Reviewers also wanted to know, uh, like them, well, there were functional questions, let's say, and we did this experiment without expecting too much. For all the EAE models, you inject interferon gamma into the uh, white matter tracks, and uh, not white matter, uh, um, CSF ventricles, but really nothing happens unless you immunize the mice. We did that, and as expected, we injected this time into the white matter tract. As expected, there is no lesion. There is nothing. But when we did that on 18 months old mice, we saw this almost perfect demyelinating lesions. That was really a question, like why in the age mice interferon gamma killed oligodendrocytes? So we go to the reduced system, we took the uh, oligodendrocyte cultures, we dumped the interferon gamma, and actually we have a lot of different concentrations. We go quite high and they just turn stat one positive and happy. Uh, we didn't really see any difference. Unless you add a little bit microglia in this culture. With the microglia, they, live, they culture really beautifully, actually. They a co-culture of oligodendrocyte microglia looking much healthier, much happier, until you infect, uh, drop the interferon gamma. When you drop the interferon gamma, the only oligos at, I think this is 18 hours, uh, you count are, as you see, these red dots are in lysosomes of the microglia. So... That was quite interesting. So we this is very simplistic model, but what we proposing here is aging. Uh, myelin is a special structure, high cholesterol, and after histone, second longest living com protein uh, complex in our brain, and that accumulates oxidative stress, and that is handled by microglia. But eventually microglia is a macrophage we'll call cavalry, CD8s. And, but that's in the brain, they don't survive too long, but it's enough to induce some interferon response microglia and microglia at that age is little bit PTSD maybe. They overreact and we don't know if it's specific to oligodendrocytes, but they lead to oligolos. And when you lose the oligodendrocytes, what you can still neurons communicate, but that will cost them 5,000 fold more. And that might be the initial metabolic, uh, that what we see in the, the neurodegeneration, there is a peak of uh, brain metabolism increase, energy demand increase, and then it collapses. Maybe that collapse is caused by the demyelinating and myelin uh, microglia dysfunction. So this was, uh, we didn't work on the regeneration. So we, this was a surprising uh, direction. We are now working on uh, JEC stat inhibitors and we saw in the Alzheimer disease models, they are protective, but a really key study came and that was quite stunningly uh, showed uh, what we our direction is um, not uh, not well that was I was pretty shocked when I saw these results so the uh, David Holtzman has this model which is uh, which express uh, OPOE4 together with mutant tau and the mouse develops this severe uh, atrophy of the brain. You see the ventricular enlargement compared to the uh, normal mice. And what they did is, and this mouse had been subject to a lot of tests and 10% improvement is the nature paper. Uh, but what they did this time is uh, before the onset, two months, they depleted the T cells with anti-CD3 and CD8 antibodies, CD4 and CD8 antibodies. 
And then they look to the ventricular enrichment. And as you can see, black and white, and also the very significantly here, the mice was rescued almost at the uh, certain parameters. This is really shocking because as a neurodegeneration scientist, what we learned is protein aggregations, neuron die, blood brain brain collapse, and T cells comes to see the scene. So they are morally, mostly uh, forensic cell types coming after the whole events, whole the action is done. Here and in the aging, what we see T cells are being effectors that leading to neurodegeneration. They are very rare. So that's why we kind of could ignore them because you actually see in every third section one or two of them. So that you can, if you are doing stainings, it's very easy to ignore them. But with that uh, help of the uh, single cell and the high throughput result, uh, analysis, we capture this kind of events. So coming back to where we start, it is not that T cells are bad because uh, there are a lot of people who also show that T cells maintain brain homeostasis, maintain protein aggregation, activate uh, uh, microglia to clear up the uh, protein aggregation. But what we see here is at least uh, in certain models, CD8 and transant uh, survival in the brain overlaps with this inflection point and both uh, TOE to APOE4 model and the aging models we saw, if we eliminate that entrance, we can flatten this curve. Even more interesting, if you flatten this curve, you see something interesting because then you see that all of the slopes almost go linearly. Of course, cancer, you accumulate more mutations as you age, but inflammation is brain is also dementia is also the one factor. Maybe the inflammation accelerates our aging and this T cell and adaptive immune system privilege of the nervous system keeps that dementia risk on this low slope. So maybe we can learn from brain to apply other systems as well. I have, well, I'm actually doing pretty well. Nobody is asking questions, so I assume my accent is almost British. And no questions, I think. So I will move to the second part of my talk, which is use, ah, Benjamin, please go for it. Hi, hi. Um, such beautiful data. I ha I have a question. Can you just comment on the nature of the mi microglia T cell interaction? Do you, do you think that's an epitope specific interaction? What What's going on there? Oh, that's well. I I don't know. Uh, that's actually the one of the biggest uh, gambles we will do in our mind lab. We are doing a lot of TCR sequencing and antigen searching. Uh, there are. Uh, if you look to the David Gate paper with Tony Viscarol, they find the antigens for uh, Epstein-Barr virus, but Epstein-Barr is everywhere, so I'm kind of not really buying it. There is a really solid evidence from uh, Parkinson field, like the alpha synuclein being, uh, uh, I think, synuclein 135 phospho being the peptide. Uh, and alternatively, when you look to the other uh, fields, like the muscle, like the T-Rex and the CD8 goes after exercise, and this is actually antigen dependent, seems to be. Uh, however, I don't know. Uh, in the brain, and because you also have a cytokines, T cells don't do homing in the brain. So if it is a antigen dependent, it's going to be very low affinity or you're going to have a, like we are looking into, a, a, that's the, always the debate with the immuno, neuroimmunologists. They don't buy this because what they say is uh, we don't know what we are talking about and uh, this kind of interaction because they look to the encephalitis brain, even for the MS, we couldn't find the antigen. And MS is way more immune disease than the aging or neurodegeneration. So if it is antigen dependent, it's going to be not easy. 
uh, to nail that down. So it's, uh, uh, I think with the initial studies, we were lucky, uh, a group of people, just because you take out, you functionally show, but which antigen and how this antigen dependency and do we have the certain pattern of the TCR sequences? Yes, it's, it's, a, it's a something that I think we can't ignore. And I think it's worth to, to risk there, but I'm very scared to dive into that. Uh, but machine learning and forward, like the uh, immune engineering is very powerful right now. If there is something, we are in the right phase of the time to mind that. But yeah, this question is something keeps me scared. Thank you. So the... I was going to talk about our second part, which is the technology, actually. Uh, what we were always interested, you realize most of our studies start with the, with the white matter. We capture a cell type, we go to the SAM electron microscopy and stain and combine that together. And there is always this jumps from different modalities. And these are big jumps, like we see something and then another cohort try to see the same thing. Instead of that, we thought, well, there is now this Murphish technology and electron microscopy. Can we do them together on the same section? And no, we can't. Electron microscopy is special. Uh, so what we could do is take one section to the Murphish one section to the electron microscopy and merge this information. And we didn't know how to merge it, but we nevertheless decide if we can do it or not. So the Murphish is, I think this group don't need it, but it's a single molecule imaging method that we can actually take 12 micron sections and individual microns, we can analyze it. And here you see that we induce a white matter lesion, uh, isolexatin, into the three animals. Uh, and here you see individual cells. And here you see the lesion, white matter lesions on the side. And then you see the immune cells are actually this isolexatin lesions, very little microphage infiltration, most of the microglia accumulates in this uh, tracks, and then we can analyze all the cell types. This is around 300 probe set. We now can do 1,000 probes in the Merscope. And Martina took the adjacent section, embedded into the resin, and then cut this 15 micron section, 200 nanometer thin sections, and two serial electron microscopy. And you see the region, to our knowledge, this is one of the largest areas for this type of serial electron microscopy. And you can see the lesion area as well here. When we have, since they are uh, um, adjacent, we overlay these sections. And you can see that it murphish identities on the color dots and EM image there. And you can zoom into the healthy myelin, you see the myelin and white matter tracks, and the lesion area is uh, filled with lots of debris and uh, uh, immune cells. So next, we move to the, the problem with the electron microscopy. We did some annotations on the expert pathologist, but it's pretty subjective. To do this objectively, Han Yi, a master student, went through and for each microglia of one to two uh, sections, she segmented these eight organas, eochromatin, heterochromatin, organelles field area, lysosomes, mitochondria, empty cytoplasm, and endoplasmic reticulum, these tunnels, and lipid droplet field area. And with this, we have this, so you need to first uh, respect the uh, honey. You need, there's thousands uh, dots in here and each of them take almost half an hour. And, but that gave us the opportunity first time cluster the lesion cells, which are mostly microglia and except the cluster four, uh, 
based on their ultrastructure. So here you see the UMAP of the microglia uh, clustered unbiasedly based on their ultrastructure. We tried uh, machine learning uh, segmentation, didn't work in our hands. So if you look this data, what you see is cluster four is, uh, uh, cluster five is filled with this lipid droplet filled area, these white spots. And when you look at the lipid droplet, the cytosol area, it's clear like that. Then cluster three marks mitochondria to ER. And when you look to the cluster three, it's actually uh, interferon response, no, basically, uh, this is interferon response microglia, and we saw that mitochondria to ER length is marking them. I have no clue what does it mean. Nucleus to cytosol ratio marks this cluster four, and these are the T cells in, um, in the lesion area clustered in here. One interesting thing here is uh, one interesting thing here to mention, DAM, disease uh, damage-associated microglia area is cluster zero to two. What you see there is first mitochondria at the cluster zero increase, and cluster two also down. It decreases at the cluster two, and then lysosome to cytosol ratio is increasing. You can think about what does it mean, but it kind of makes sense and it opens quite a bit of senses. Uh, uh, blind to the segmentation, uh, the, our neuropathologist annotate, uh, uh, Martina, annotate uh, uh, each cell, um, 200 of them. And here we see the correlation of her annotations and the clusters. So you see the T cells is the cluster for, so that's why we know which cluster is what. And now we have, I didn't mention you, but I took it out for the time, but actually I'm doing fine. We had also the single cell RNA seq from the same animals. Uh, and we now have the Murphish and single cell, and this is kind of a standard. We just integrated these two data sets. And then we had the problem of the EM. They are, they, we have no anchors there. You can't really uh, combine that. So we decide something pretty simple idea. Neighbors share the information, so the neighbors should share the ultrastructure and transcriptome. And for that, we take a maximum projection of the two sections, as good as we can. And then we overlay this uh, average the neighbors of the electron microscope to uh, Murphish and vice versa. So now we have two lists, one imputed ultrastructurally EM, one imputed transcriptionally. But two data sets, both of them are full of full data sets, like we have all transcriptome and ultrastructural uh, values of these cells. So does it work? We kind of wanted to test that. And the first question we asked us, what are the cells, uh, what are the genes correlate with endoplasmic reticulum area? So we see that some cells are oh, full of okay. quick, sure. There's a quick quick question in the chat. Can I? Uh, yeah, yeah, sure, yeah. Sure. So it's uh, from Alex Friedas who's saying, a uh, very interesting talk. Uh, did you notice any effect of the interferon response of microglia on astrocytes in the white matter, or is the effect just specific to oligodendrocytes? No, we do have the, actually it's, we do have the astrocytes as well. Astrocytes are quite sparse in our single cell data and also in the white matter track. We have inter astrocytes and uh, so the basically in this paper also we have the T cells. Um, I took out of that too as well. They are also around CD8 T cells. Uh, there is a, uh, what happens is we have a interferon T cells clustered very tightly around them, uh, my interferon response microglia and uh, the inner core. And there is a larger radius of interferon response astrocytes and oligos. Mm -hmm. Since we were focusing in the white matter, oligos are sparse. So 
it was hard to work on them, but we see astrocytes there, but the T cells, since they are in the white matter astrocyte, white matter astrocytes are super interesting topic, but it's like the interneurons of the white matter tract, really hard to study. Okay. Uh, yes, we see them, but they are tough. Uh, they are one of the tough ones to get enough and to say something confidently. Interesting. So how sparse percentage-wise in a single cell experiment? Uh, astrocytes, we get them, uh, actually we get astrocytes in the single cell, they are not so sparse, but when you image and other things, we still get them in the normal white matter tracks, but not as much as oligos. Like the, it was, we went for the easy, well, we went for the easy one, but I, I think it is not, actually, I don't know, we, uh, we, attempted to do the experiment with the microglia oligodendrocyte and then at the astrocytes if it is specific to the oligodendrocytes. Then you can think about many uh, MS to other disorders. If there is such a preference, you can actually make sense and if astrocytes avoid it. But I moved and we didn't do this experiments. Okay, great. Thanks. <laughs> so... Yeah, I was here. So the uh, Senate check, we asked the, which genes correlate with the endoplasmic radiculum area. And actually endoplasmic radiculum genes are correlating with this its area. So all these genes are ER structural proteins and the Go pathways that come on this correlation upside were all related to ER. Other side is also interesting, but I wanted to go to the mitochondria. When you look to the mitochondria positively regulated, you see mitochondrial matrix. Heterochromatin area, sin 3 r RDNA, heterochromatin is first. So this is really, really impressive. We were like, wow, that might have worked. So to see if that worked, can we look to the individual gene to the feature correlation? And I need to walk you through, but I'm really proud of this one. This is kind of crazy. So here, focus on the first center. It's just Spearman correlation. You see the genes, and you see the features that we measured, electron microscopy. And when we look there, we see this initial cluster, all interferon response genes, and they have different correlations with different features, and they mark here. Just to explain that, if you remember, we had two imputed genes, one spatially transferred EM, and here you can see interferon response a microglia tracks the this area, and we have also the another one, spatially trans, uh, transferred transcripts, and there also interferon response marks this area. So this area, of this square interferon response microglia in both of the genes comes from. And you can see all of the genes actually start one, IEF, uh, IEFT1, the IEFT3. These are our top interferon response genes. And there is, when you include structure, you see more diversity within there. And some of the genes really strongly correlate. And some of them negatively correlate. That's also another interest. Damage associated microglia region is here. Uh, it, homoesthetic didn't really correlate well. It actually doesn't work on the homoesthetic very well, the correlation, if you see. So there's some noise on there. So here we see the mostly uh, phagocytic damage associated microglia genes. And there's uh, multiple layers in there. But when you look to the last cluster, which is very well uh, localized, you see the uh, uh, foamy microglia. We call it foamy microglia because GPN and B, OPOE, and these guys are full of uh, lipid droplets. So they are foamy and the name comes from foamy macrophages and they share actually the similar uh, markers of the foamy macrophages and arteriosclerotic plaques. And GPNMB is uh, uh, Parkinson G, upper E is probably the biggest Alzheimer risk gene and they are strongly marking that, linking to the lipid metabolism, white matter to the many diseases and this population. And that was actually our major goal to 
nailed down in this uh, study. So I'm in the four to five minutes mark. So maybe I can stop here if you have some questions. And we can actually, so the, yeah, that's the, practically my group right now is trying to, one second. So we try to include uh, spatial transcriptomics and train B machine learnings. We will be trying to include uh, other op spatial technologies, spatial proteomics and lipidomics into the, this picture. But yeah, the, I think the spatial is really exciting. So that's the, uh, that opens up quite, like for me, it was really shocking that it actually worked this kind of uh, integration, just using the uh, adjacent sections. <laughs>